March 25th outside of Benson, Arizona. Leave it to Michael to pick a place filled with trucks, junk, and no clear-cut meeting place. Maria stepped into the pie and stuff diner and marveled at the smell. Pie, yes, but grease too and aftershave. Apparently all diners did not smell alike, nor did they look alike. This one had windows on three sides with a counter running down the middle and a kitchen that seemed to take up half the space. Men with greasy hair and bolo ties sat at the tables and more men sat at the counter. Beside them sat big pots of the darkest coffee Maria had ever seen. Michael was not in here. She could tell that from the first glance. Still, she had to go through the motions like everyone else. They had arrived at the junction about 15 minutes ago and st stared at the buildings in dismay. Maria counted five fast food restaurants, a very cheap looking run down motel, a super duper truck stop that seemed to have everything except an auditorium and the gas mart that Michael had mentioned. Michael wasn't in or near the gas mart and Valenti had to use that as his excuse to get annoyed. He seemed to think it was someone's fault, Maria's, Isabel's, Alex, that Michael hadn't given an, out enough information about the meeting place. Valenti had taken it as a personal affront that they now had to search for the elusive Michael Guerin. Again. So Maria had volunteered for the diner since she was good at chatting up people. Alex and Isabel took the super duper truck stop since Valenti didn't want anyone going in there and loan, and Valenti himself took all of the fast food joints. Alex had watched him go and laughed saying maybe Valenti was hungry. They had left the van Valenti had borrowed in front of the gas mart. Isabel and Michael might recognize it because of the plates and the sheriff's sticker. Maria had her doubts. Sometimes she wondered if Michael recognized her. He couldn't be relied on to recognize a van out of context in front of a 24 hour gas station in a convenience store. Help you? The waitress asked. She was older than Maria's mom and wore way too much makeup. Her foundation was too dark and her eyeshadow too green. She even had on false eyelashes, which Maria had never actually seen someone wear outside of a theater. Um, yeah, Maria said, I'm looking for a friend of mine. He said to meet him here. The waitress took a step closer and lowered her voice. Honey, you don't want to wait here, not without a friend or two watching you. You know what I mean? Maria felt a shiver run down her back. I know, I have some friends over at the truck stop next door and one of my dad's friends, one of my friend's dad is across the street. We're all looking for the same guy. I thought you said he was going to meet you here. Here being the junction. He didn't say where here. Oh, the waitress said. She frowned as if she were concentrating. What's he look like? He's got brown hair, combed back away from his face, and, oh wait, Maria rummaged in her purse. She had a picture of Michael that she'd taken on her trip to Las Vegas. This is him. She shoved the picture at the waitress, who stared at it for a long time. Your boyfriend, she asked at last. And he's missing. I guess you could say that, Maria said. And he's missing? No, he called this afternoon and said for all of us to meet him here. I've never seen him before, hun, but I just came on. Let me ask. And before Maria could stop her, the waitress took the photo towards the counter. Cinda, you seen this guy? Another waitress poked her head out of the kitchen door. She wore a smooth red wig that was slightly askew. She held a cigarette in her left hand. What do you want, Diane? I'm getting ready to leave. Just look at this picture and tell me if you've seen this guy. Why? The other waitress, waitress asked. Because this girl ha here has misplaced her boyfriend, Diane said, looking over her shoulder. Yeah, haven't we all, Cinda said. Except you, Cinda, Diane said. Come on, I saw you with that guy tonight. Cinda gave her a slow smile and then a single shoulder shrug. I don't know why I just shrugged my shoulders. <laughs> a single shoulder shrug. Um, some nights are better than others. She took the photo from Diane and looked at it, then looked at Maria. Hun, she said. Hun was apparently a common nickname around these parts. You shouldn't be chasing after a guy like this so late at night. Like, you're one to talk, Cinda, the guy, said a guy at the counter. I am one to talk, Larry. Why'd you think I'm working here? Because I like the company? Well, yeah. Cinda shook her head and distract, directed her next comment at Maria. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for guys like this and their tendency to run off when they find out they're about to get an instant family. I didn't plan to waitress the rest of my life. Neither did Maria. But she had a hunch now she was not was now was not the time to say that nor was it the time to say that she had a similar job just in a better place with less grease have you seen him maria asked it would have been sometime tonight nope can't say as i have cinda said but i haven't been paying much attention tonight most everyone in here is something of a regular you know folks who drive through and make sure they stop here for coffee or for the pie she tapped the photo with long fake glittery nail 
But you know, I'd remember this guy. He's kind of cute. Yeah, Maria said, grabbing the photo. He is. Diane was watching her with a grin. Well, show that picture around, hon. When they're not the only pair of eyes in this place. Maria did, somewhat reluctantly. She was glad she'd worked at the crash down or most of her customers were tourists or locals. She hadn't seen this much hair oil, not gel like Michael used, in one place at one time, maybe ever. It took her a while to make it around the room, but by the time she was done, it was clear no one had seen him. And since she didn't know how he was coming here, whether by truck or by some other means, she couldn't ask about that either. When she was done going around the diner, she thanked everyone. Cinda had disappeared into the back, and a faint trace of cigarette smell told Maria that Cinda was finishing her smoke. Thanks, she said to Diana as she made her way to the door. If he comes in here, would you tell him that we're all here and waiting for him? I'll do just that, honey. You be careful now, okay? Okay, Maria backed out the door to the cool night. She hadn't been nervous before she went into that place. Now she was seeing creeps hiding in the shadows everywhere. She didn't even look at the cars in the diner's parking lot like she was supposed to. Instead, she wanted to find Isabel and Alex or Sheriff Valenti, anyone so she wasn't on this neon-covered highway all by herself. It seemed to take forever to cross the parking lot at the truck stop. She headed for the side entrance until she saw a scrawny tr truck driver coming out, his hair wet, his shirt off, his jeans unsnapped, and a damp towel wrapped around his neck. She didn't even say excuse me. Instead, she hurried into the front entrance where she almost ran into Alex and Isabel. They were coming out looking very discouraged. No Michael, I take it, Maria said. Not that we could find, Isabel said. You know there's showers and stuff back there, Maria waved her hand in the general area of that trucker. No, I didn't. Isabel looked surprised. She glanced at the other entrance. Maybe Alex should, Alex will not. There are places that sane people do not go no matter what's happening, Alex said. If anyone goes, it'll be Sheriff Valenti, and maybe we'll convince him to take his gun. It can't be that bad, Isabel said. Maria shuddered, thinking of the half-dressed half truck driver. Alex has pretty good instincts, she said. No Michael at the diner, Isabel asked. Nope, but I didn't check the parking lot very well. It's spookier here than I thought. Let's do a check together, Alex said. They started to walk around the parking lot, peering at cars to see if anyone was in them. Maria didn't... Oh. Maria didn't know what they do about the long haul trucks. If Michael was in one of those, they'd never find him. He'd have to find them. Where's the sheriff, Isabel asked. Alex pointed towards the motel. The sheriff's van was now parked under the street light and through the open window in the well-lit manager's office, Maria could make out Valenti's back. He was gesturing toward the rooms and the woman behind the desk kept shaking her head. Doesn't look like he's having a lot of luck, Maria said. I don't think Michael would be here, Isabel said. It's not his style. Oh, I think it's just his style, Maria said. A place with a bedroom that hasn't seen clean sheets since the Titanic sank. I wonder if he ever knew what this place looked like, Alex said. I mean, Michael's usually pretty specific about stuff. When it's important to him, Maria said. This is important to him, Alex said. He wanted us here for a reason. He said the gas mart, right, Isabel said. I think so, but there's no one there. Maria looked across the street. The gas mart was the only place without a car in the parking lot. She found that unnerving all by itself. He's just not here yet, Alex said. I think we need to be patient and wait, right? Maria asked. There was more of an edge to her voice than she planned on. Alex raised his eyebrow, eyebrows. It's not my fault that you two have scheduling conflicts, Maria. You're the only guy here, Maria said. Who else can I blame? There was no one in the cars around them and no one in the diner's parking lot either. The customers inside the diner hadn't changed. Maria sat on a bench outside the diner. She was tired. She'd been up since early that morning and her entire day had been focused on Michael Guerin. Maybe the waitress, Cinda, was right? It was time to start concentrating on herself instead of focusing on a man? She reached inside her purse and pulled out her cell phone. It was still working and still had power. Then she stared at it, realizing what she had done. She had vowed not to focus on Michael while she was checking to see if he had called. She had it bad. She used to tease Liz about the way she felt about Max, but it was nothing compared with all the time Maria had wasted on Michael. Alex put a hand on her shoulder. His touch was comforting, just like his friendship. Don't worry, he said. He'll be here. Soon, I hope, Isabel said. Yeah, Maria said, trying to sound tough. This was not how I planned to spend my weekend. Oh, I don't know, Alex said, sitting beside her. Hang out at the diner, talking to friends. Isn't that how you always spend your weekend? Maria smiled in spite of herself. You're not helping, Alex, Isabel said. It's okay, Maria said. At that moment, Valenti pulled up and leaned out of the window of the van. Anything? The three of them shook their heads. Me either, he looked at Grim. 
What's the plan, Sheriff? Isabel asked. He glanced at all of them. Right now there's no plan, he said. I guess we just wait. Oh, goody, Maria said. Wait for Michael, like I've never done that before. Okay, chapter 18, March 25th, Lawrence Junction, Arizona. Jerry sat at the table. The main room was dark except for the light coming from the computer screen. When Dane was gone, Jerry made sure he kept the place dark so that it didn't look like anyone was here. It would be hard enough to defend the place with only two guys. It was nearly impossible with one. He scanned the emails. Fifteen more people had emailed him. They found the website and were writing for help. He couldn't read the letters anymore. The soft stories were starting to get to him. Sometimes they made him mad. Like, who cared that some kid couldn't sleep for the night because he was in so much pain? Was that any of Jerry's business, really? But sometimes they got to him. Until he started this scam, he didn't think there was anything that could get to him anymore, but he had been wrong. If even 10 of these 15 came through, he and Dane would have reached their money goal, and then they'd be done. Not a moment too soon. Jerry wasn't sure he had the stomach for this anymore. The sound of an engine grew in the distance. It sounded like Dane's truck, but Jerry wasn't sure. He put the computer on sleep mode and grabbed the gun he kept beside it. Then he walked toward the window. He and Dane had discussed defense plans a hundred times. Dane had contended that anyone who drove down this road had no idea what or who was waiting at the other end. Jerry had disagreed, often loudly. The cops would drive down the road. They would think that two guys could take them. They'd make as much noise as they wanted. The argument never really was settled. Jerry peered out the window. The night was darker than he liked, and his eyes still hadn't adjusted. He squinted, saw the familiar shape of Dane's truck as a darker blob against the night sky. Jerry waited until it was a little closer just to confirm, and then he went back to his spot near the computer. The truck pulled up and stopped. The engine shut off, and almost simultaneously, the truck door slammed. Dane was moving faster than usual. His boots clomped on the front porch, and then he opened the front, the main door. Jerry, he asked softly. Right here, Jerry said. He didn't like the way this was going. What's up? You have problems tonight? No, why? There's a car in the turnout, parked with its lights off. Jerry cursed. You think they know about us? Can't tell. Think maybe they might just be sleeping it off, you know? But I don't know for sure. Thought I'd tell you first. Let the brains deal with it, Jerry thought. Good. He, tra he trained better. He trained Dane better than he realized. There was also a guy in the ditch, but he couldn't have, but he could have been taking a whiz, Dane said. I didn't get a good look at him. A guy in the ditch? Now that was an unusual place, piece of information. Yeah, but like I said, I didn't get a good look at him. I did look in my rearview mirror as I drove here, though, and he didn't follow me, at least by car. Well, I didn't see him on foot, either. Jerry resisted the urge to shake his head. Dane might see that and take offense. You would have been moving faster than he was if he walked. I mean, getting on the road. Dane's tone bordered on irritated. All right, Jerry's heart was pounding. He didn't like this news at all. He knew the next question would bother Dane, too, but he had to ask it. So you, were you followed? I'm not an idiot. Dane wheeled towards him. It was that moment that Jerry realized Dane had his gun out. Jerry held up his hands just like people did in old movies. I wasn't saying you were, Dane, just checking everything. Besides, smartass, if I was being followed, the car wouldn't have gotten here ahead of me and parked with its lights out. True enough, Jerry said, which begged the question then, just what, what was a car doing there? And had Dane been followed before? I stopped twice on the way back, and I would have seen it the same car was behind me, not to mention that it would have been pretty obvious on the highway this late. Yes, it would. Jerry hadn't brought his arms down. Dane was a little too on edge for him. That was a dumb question. I shouldn't have asked it. Damn straight, Dane said. Jerry eased his hands down. The car that was parked there, and the guy. He let his voice trail off. He was going to take this next part slow. Yeah, Dane asked. They saw you turn, right? Yeah. They might not have known there was a road here before that. So, so maybe they might want to explore it. Dane didn't move for a long moment. You're paranoid, you know that? Yes, Jerry said. I mean, you say I worry too much, but you act like everything's going to go wrong. So you don't mind if some stranger comes down here and asks for a drink of water? Dane cursed. I was hoping for some sleep. Me too, Jerry said. But you're a lousy shot. Yes, Jerry said. At least Dane had believed that lie. So I've got to sit on the porch all night and see if anyone comes down the road? We can both do it, Jerry said. Oh yeah, like that'll work. He'll talk to me and then we'll be distracted and we'll miss whatever it is that you think's going to happen. We can do a perimeter search first, Jerry said. Then I'll come back in and finish some work on the computer. 
away from the window, Dean said. Right, Jerry said. Okay, Dean frowned at him. Let's go. He headed back towards the door. Jerry waited just a moment, checking his gun. His stomach was jumping. He didn't like how any of this sounded. He should have known better than to trust Dane. Who knew what Dane had told that waitress or his buddies along the route? Dane had opinions and he liked to share them. And sometimes when he did, he used facts from his own life to back them up. Dane looked over his shoulder. You coming? Because if you're not, you better tell me. Or if you plan to do something else, you better tell me that too. I see someone sneaking around the house. I'm not gonna ask if it's you. I'm gonna shoot, you got that? Of course I do, Jerry took a deep breath. I'm following you. Good, Dane said and pulled the door open. There wasn't enough scrub and the rocks along the side of the dirt road didn't give the right kind of cover to hide behind. Max scurried down the road, trying not to go too fast. There was a steep decline and he was worried about sliding down it and making a lot of noise. Michael didn't seem worried about the noise at all. In fact, Michael seemed more focused than usual, his gaze forward, his expression intense. Max had only seen Michael like that a few times, and none of them had been good, at least for the people he directed that energy against. They hadn't really discussed a plan. Michael said they didn't really need one, but Max was uncomfortable taking orders from Michael. Apparently, whenever there was trouble, they really did fall into the leader and general roles they had on their planet. And a leader didn't take orders from his general. Advice, yes, but not orders. Max had tried to talk to Michael about a plan, and Michael wouldn't listen. This isn't your battle, Maxwell, Michael had said. Max had tried to argue, but Michael had shushed him. You don't know what I've been through the past 24 hours, Michael said. These guys are mine. Somehow, with Michael acting with that much determination, Max was unwilling to argue with him. He let Michael take the lead, as uncomfortable as that made him, although he did exact two promises from Michael. First, Max wanted to make sure no one got killed. Michael didn't answer that one directly. We'll do whatever it takes, Maxwell. If they try to hurt hurt you, then they answer to me. That seemed fair enough. The other promise was also important, though. Max wanted all the information on the serum and the people who were scammed. When he said that, Michael had looked at him. We're stopping this all the way, Michael said, and this means letting people know they've been taken. So yeah, we get all the stuff. Max didn't tell him that the fake meds also went to the reporter. It would have been one thing too many for Michael, and it was unnecessary at this point. He just had to survive the next few minutes. Max rounded the corner at the bottom of the decline and saw a house tucked in against the rocks. The house looked dilapidated even in this poor light. The truck he had seen a few minutes before was parked outside, its engine ticking. He thought he heard voices speaking quickly as if they were having an argument just inside the door. Michael gave him a signal to follow. Max wasn't sure when Michael got ahead of him. They had just made it around the truck when the front door opened. A man the size of a tree came out, a gun in his hand, Another smaller man stood behind him. That's him, Michael whispered, but, my, but Max wasn't sure which man Michael was referring to. It didn't matter. The large man saw Max and Michael and raised his gun. Chapter 19, March 25th, Lawrence Junction, Arizona. Liz shifted in the car seat. Tess was concentrating so hard beside her that she seemed to be vibrating. Nyla was staring straight ahead, unmoving. Liz wasn't sure if that was Nyla's reaction to what Tess was doing or if that was what she'd been doing normally while she waited. All this silence was driving Liz crazy and she couldn't do much about it. Tess had carefully explained to her that she wasn't going to be part of the illusion, that whatever, whatever she did in the back seat might register for Nyla. Tess wasn't sure how long Max was going to be gone and she didn't want to use too much energy making certain Nyla didn't follow him. If Liz got out of the car, Nyla would know. But neither Tess nor Nyla seemed to register the presence of the other cars, the truck that had turned down the lane with its lights on, driving as if it always went that, that way, and the car that pulled up shortly thereafter with its lights off. Max had hidden in a ditch when the truck showed up and had gotten out after the second car parked. Then he talked to the other driver. They were too far away for Liz to see them clearly in the dark, and she couldn't hear anything they said. She couldn't even risk opening a window to try to listen, and she didn't even dare talk to Tess for fear of breaking her concentration. But what if the second driver had pulled a gun on Max? What if Max was in trouble? How would she know? She had to trust that he could take care of himself, that he wouldn't do anything foolish. But she wasn't comfortable with any of this. Sitting quietly in the dark while Tess made an illusion for Nyla in the front seat was just not with the style. Still, she knew better than to take matters into her own hands. It would make things worse, no matter how much she wanted to get out of the car. She had to hold herself in place and concentrate on that. Nothing. It was critical. And she managed to do it for a good half hour after Max disappeared down the road. Her ears were trained on each and every sound. 
She didn't move and concentrated as hard as she could on everyone remaining safe, on controlling herself and her impulses. She clenched her hands together and held them in her lap, her fingers squished together. A moment later, a series of loud bangs echoed in the silence. Gunshots? She couldn't tell in the desert in the closed up car, but they sounded like gunshots. It took all her willpower to stay in the car, and if something didn't happen fast, she wasn't going to much longer. Jerry's fingers slid on the grip of his gun. He was sweating despite the chill of the evening. He was no good at this cloak and dagger stuff. Give him a computer and an idea and he would do just fine. But walking into a situation holding a gun made him realize just how stupid his life had become. Dane stepped out the front door and stopped. He cursed under his breath and raised his gun. Jerry's breath caught in his throat. Suddenly the world exploded. Dane flew backward at him, his gun firing his pain. It all seemed to be happening in slow motion. Jerry tried to get out of the way of the flying body of the huge man, but he didn't have a chance. Dane slammed into him, and they flew backward into the wall between the front area and the kitchen. Jerry hit first so hard that his jaw snapped closed. Pain radiated from his neck down his body. It all registered fast, so fast that he had, that he knew he had no chance of fighting the unconsciousness that was sneaking over him. Although he tried. He really tried. Max stared at the raised gun. This huge guy was going to shoot them for no apparent reason. This, more than anything, confirmed that they had found the right place. Max started to raise his hand to make a protective energy shield. He'd stopped bullets with it before, but before he could face his palm forward, Matt, Michael's hand went up. From it flowed light and energy so strong that Max could feel the edges of it. The light focused like a laser at the big guy, hitting him so hard that it pushed him backward with the force of an explosion. The guy's gun went off twice, the sound echoing impossibly loud in the desert and rocks and then Mac couldn't see the guy anymore. What was that, Max snapped. Sometimes you have to be ready to take action, Maxwell, Michael said, sounding calmer than he should have. Max ran forward. He had, had, he had said no killing, and then Michael had done this. Michael was right behind him, guarding his back, apparently worried that there was more of them. Max took the porch steps in one leap and stopped in front of the open door. The big guy had smashed the smaller guy into the wall. They were both unconscious and both breathing. But judging from the position of their legs, they weren't going anywhere soon. One of the big man's legs looked as if someone had bent it up and touched the back of his head with it. His gun was on the floor under the table. Max wasn't about to heal them, not until he found out who they were. They may have others, Michael said, referring to the guns. You check them, Max said. I'll look for a rope. He flipped on a light, revealing a main room filled with garage sale furniture and an old dining room table. On top of the table was an expensive new computer. He glanced at the computer but didn't go there, yet. Instead, he went to the old-fashioned kitchen. On the tables were bottles, some labeled, some not. Dirty dishes were piled in the sink and empty TV dinner cartons lined the counters. An open toolbox stood on the floor and inside it along with another gun was rope, more than enough to tie up the guys in the, in the front room. Max grabbed it, leaving the gun behind it, and walked back to Michael. Together, they tied up the, man, the men. You're sure this is the guy? Max asked, staring at the broken form of the big man. He had blood running from a gash on his cheek, and there was doubt he'd been walking. He wouldn't be walking for a long, long time. Michael nodded. I don't want you helping them, Maxwell. I'm not even tempted, Max said. Michael stood and stared into the room. Now what? You search. I'll see what I can find on that computer. Max headed towards the dining room table. Be careful. I already found another gun. I checked. They don't have any more on them. Good, Max said. Michael headed towards the kitchen. And don't touch anything unless you have to, Max said. We don't. We want the cops to find this just as it is. Don't worry, Maxwell, Michael said. If I need to pick, up, pick something up, I put my hand in my sleeve, just like in the movies. He said all of that with a straight face. He wasn't joking. He would do just that. And Max had to do the same thing while working on the keyboard. No fingerprints. No sign that they were there. Except Max wanted two things, and he knew they'd show up on the computer's hard drive. First, he wanted a list of all the people hurt by the scam, and then he wanted to see if anyone else was involved besides these two men. He grabbed his two super disk and downloaded the entire hard drive. While the computer chugged away, Michael paced from room to room, his face getting grimmer. Those bottles look like the ones they gave me, he said, and I found the money. Leave it, Max said. Maybe the police can figure out who it belongs to. Don't worry, Michael said. One illegal trip to Las Vegas is more than enough for me. Max grinned in spite of himself, remembering the trip they took to get rid of the $50,000 Michael had been given by his real family. Blood money, Michael had said, in every sense of the word, rather like this stuff was. 
Michael stopped before him, beside him. What are you doing? Just getting some stuff, Max said. Wipe that keyboard clean. Don't worry, Max said. How long is this going to take? Another few minutes, Max said. I'm downloading the entire hard drive. Michael shook his head. For that recorder of yours? No, Max said. She's our next problem, you know. No, she's not, Max said. She's our key out of this. Michael frowned at him, clearly not understanding. Max stood. He had to take care of this anyway. Stay here. Make sure the computer doesn't freeze. And keep an eye on those guys. Why? Michael asked. I'm going to get the recorder. Not a good idea, Maxwell. Max smiled at him. Actually, it's the best one I've had all day. That is chapter 19. This one reads a lot easier. Yeah. It reads fast. Very fast. A lot of dialogue, which I like, too. A lot of dialogue. Back and forth. And then... Well, what I noticed when you weren't here, it's a lot of, like, he said, she said. And I'm like, can't they mix that up a little bit? Like, he replied, <laughs> she replied, she asked. Like, <laughs> I know, they say that a lot. A lot. <laughs> like, well, we know he said, she said. Like, we get that. <laughs> Can you say Max asked three times fast? <laughs> Max yeah, there's that too. Max asked, Max asked, Max asked. <laughs> I know. It's the worst. <laughs> Becky asked if we can start Green Men on Sunday after we finish this one. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. That's pretty sure. You'll probably read it really fast. We'll see. If we uh, if it's not too late for anybody, we might be able to get into Little Green Men at least a couple chapters. And after Little Green Men, we're out of that first three same author, I think. Then we get into Shades and Dream walk in um, skeletons in the closet. Yeah. Yep. So when this one's an easier one for the timeline because of the stuff they talk about. So we we hear about Vegas. We hear about um, the crystals. We hear about um, after the Kyle and found Kyle in bed. We find so when you get all those little snippets, you know where they fall. So this one's definitely. This one's definitely right in my timeline because they they talk about it in the books. There's not like, oh well, this happened and this happened. It's all. I think very you had it right the first time you posted it. You had like what the first three books. You you watch up to Viva Las Vegas. You watch through that. Then you read the first three books, and then I think I forgot what happens after that. If you said to like watch more episodes and then start Shades, or you finish. So I have to find it. Hold on. I have to look it up. My I don't know. I do too. That's bad. <laughs> but um, Shades is the fourth book. Yep. Oh, okay. I see it. I see what you had now. Originally, this was back in May. You said, watch through episode 15, read the first three books, watch the rest of season two, then Shades, Dream Walk, Skeletons in the Closet, and Quarantine. And then, so originally, I thought quarantine was on the end of of uh, skeletons, but I was wrong because, excuse me, after you when you read it, she talks about how the time when Max took his shirt off. That's episode one of season three. So I was like, "Well, crap!" So then so I had to so I changed it. So quarantine is is after episode one in season, season three. three. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I think I've changed this thing like three times. The ones I know I got right are the last four. <laughs> this is after season three. But right. um, yeah, so Loose Ends is the problem child because they talk about everything all wanky. And then um, No Good Deeds and Little Green Men are here. And then after you got a, then you watch the rest of season two after those, and then you read Shades, Dreamwalk, and Skeletons, and then you, you watch season three with Step off, off and Stop after episode one, and then read Quarantine, and then you watch the rest before the last four books. I know it's confusing, <laughs> but. Yeah, so I think what happened with the first one is they were rushing to get it out and they didn't think about it, what how they were putting it together. 
because from here on, you'll notice that they'll make sure to mention things in the series correctly, mm-hmm. except for quarantine. But I think the problem with quarantine is that it was written before they took some of the stuff out of the episodes. Because originally, in, in one of the Roswell episodes, Liz is supposed to tell him about Future Max. He's supposed to. We're supposed to see that. But it got cut out somewhere. Where, I don't know. But my thinking is probably then. Because she, they talk about it in quarantine. And I was like, okay. Which wouldn't be so bad, but then they do it again in the last four books. So that annoys me. That's, that annoys me. So the last four books, the way that it's written, it needs to be said there. That's the perfect point. That's why quarantine is another problem child for me because it shouldn't, it just throws it out. And plus, you know, in season three, Michael's working at that laboratory. Well, Liz gets a scholarship there. That's never talked about. That's never, she never, Michael has to break in that place. Like, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't work well at all with the storyline. So that's why I don't like it. But that's me. You guys could be like, oh, no, I like it. But, or find out things that I see that you guys might say, oh, well, no. So, yeah, if you see something in quarantine that I don't, please let me know because I don't like it. <laughs> That's just how I am. Um, but from now on, they're much better at getting the the um, getting it right with the show, which is good. So, so yeah, I I think I've written that over like four times. <laughs> my my cheat sheet. Because the whole point was to be able to watch it and then read it and watch it so you know where it goes and follow it. That's the best watch way to repeat. do it. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's why. It's yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. Fun stuff. <laughs> the last four are still the best, though. We haven't even gotten to those yet. The best. Yeah. That's exactly. Well, those start after the season three finale. Yep, graduation. So when we get there, I'm going to tell everybody to watch graduation and then we'll read them because it's like literally takes right there. You're on the run with them. So you want to do that. And if you haven't watched the Crystal episodes in a while, I would watch those too because Little Green Men is next. Which Maybe technically you could now because they talk about it here. Trying to see these crystal episodes. So that was just disturbing behavior and how the other half lit. So is it just two? Those are the only two crystal episodes, right? I think so. 